Harvard Divinity School. Religion and Democratic Ideals, Political Futures, September 24th, 2024. My name is Hussein Rashid, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Religion and Public Life at Harvard Divinity School. Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. Welcome to a program hosted by Religion and Public Life. Religion and Public Life is dedicated to service of a just world at peace. We work with a dynamic method that has its religious literacy at its core and brings in it critical analysis to understand and challenge systems of inequity. Our focus on just peace building recognizes that a peace without justice is not sustainable. The goal of RPL programming is to bring analysis from experts, including academics, practitioners, and those living within inequitable systems, and offer some ways forward to build a more just world. The program is founded and led by Diane L. Moore, Associate Dean for RPL. This series, like all our programming, would not be possible without the support of our team, including Reem, Hillary, Anna, Natalie, Tammy, and Rochelle. I also want to mention Becca Levis, the student who conceived of this series and has been instrumental in putting it together. Thanks to them all. This series emerged from conversations with students about what politics and democracy mean. It became clear through these conversations that democracies exist in service to ideals. We are a program that looks at questions of structural inequities, so our response has to be about the structures functioning in our current political moment and creating structures of equitability. We're trying to respond to what we feel our students are asking of us while making sure that we are true to who we are. A liberal democracy should produce societies that are inclusive, equitable, dynamic, and responsive to the needs of citizens. Thinking about these outcomes that we want from a democratic system creates space for us to construct pathways to achieving these goals. For religion and public life, then, the conversation is really about democratic ideals. The focus of ideals of equitable and inclusive societies where every member is treated as valuable. That is our connection to just peace building. Our first event of this four-part series is on political futures. Ideals are often aspirational, so we think bringing futurists and organizers is a good way to frame the series. It is a focus on what is possible, not what is probable. We engage with the ideas of Jean-Paul Lederach and the moral imagination. He argues for the capacity to imagine webs of relationships, the discipline to sustain curiosity, the eternal belief in the creative act, and the willingness to take a risk. It is in that context we turn to thinking about political futures. Tonight we have two amazing speakers, Angelique Rocher, who is joining us on screen now, and Josh Wilson, who is also joining us on screen, both of whom are RPL fellows this year. Angelique Rocher, Esquire LLM, is a journalist, producer, author, and professional host from New Orleans, Louisiana. A multi-hyphenate storyteller, her work sits at the crossroads of history, current events, and its impact on pop culture. She's been seen heard on various outlets and platforms, including Harper's Bazaar, NBC News, NBC, BLK, MSNBC, AMC, BBC, Sci-Fi Wire, Disney, Marvel Studios, ESPN, and Paramount+. Plus. Prior to, enter prior to entering the entertainment field full-time, Angelique worked as a congressional staffer, political field strategist, and campaign manager. In addition, she served as the Vice President for External Affairs for the Miss Foundation for Women. Josh Wolfson is a political strategist and communications professional with a 12-year track record of building power and winning tough fights for progressive change. He first found his calling long before he was ever paid for organizing or communications when he was eight years old, handing out flyers so his two moms could get married in Massachusetts, and he promptly spent the next decade as a youth leader and organizer in his hometown in Western Mass. His professional work has included both consulting and in-house staff roles with dozens of advocacy groups, community organizations, and labor unions across the East Coast. Among those roles, he previously served as the campaign manager for Sonia Chang-Diaz's 2022 Massachusetts Cubitorial Campaign and as vice president of the labor communications firm 617 Media Group. He also played leading roles in campaigns that successfully passed a landmark $1.5 billion education equity bill, one nation-leading police reform legislation, and sought to abolish anti-Palestinian policies within Jewish organizations. 
Josh completed a Master's of Religion and Public Life at Harvard Divinity School in 2024. His project turns a spotlight on the ideological frames that consistently trap organizers and leaders seeking transformational change while articulating a resonant, commonly shared, proactive vision for changemakers today. Wow, I'm tired from reading that. Thank you both for joining us. I, I'm so pleased and so honored that you decided to take the time to be with us today and share your thoughts and vision for what our pol political futures could be. Um, and I think the first thing I want to ask both of you is help us uh, understand what is political futures? What does that mean, political futures? How do they fit together? And where does religion come in? And I will start off with you, Anjali, since you've taken yourself off mute. Oh, mm, that's what I get. Um, I think, and, and I've been I've been pondering this question um, since uh, thinking about the panel and thinking about what does a political future look like? And it, it, the question is, who does the future serve? And I think when we're thinking about a political future, we look at our now. We look at what are the everyday things that we're dealing with, um, climate change, right? Um, and I think that is one of the, the things that stick out to me is that within the next decade, within the next two decades, not even with the next century, we're looking at um, drastically changing what the needs are for every human being um, in the world. Um, looking now at what are the needs for transportation, travel, what do basic needs look like when temperatures are changing, when um, we're dealing with the loss of land. Um, you know, that's something that's particularly uh, poignant now in Louisiana as we are losing wetlands, which used to be the barrier to the state. Um, and as we lose those wetlands, we have more and more people who are suffering from property damage, who are suffering from loss of homes, loss of work, loss of uh, income. And so what does it mean with these shifts? And so in a less um, tangible form, a political future is looking at how democracy manifests itself when everybody is considered in who does the future serve? And we have a real conversation about what are basic needs. Um, because I, in, you know, and we'll probably get to this later, right now we're dealing with so much um, salesmanship when it comes to future. Um, but those futures that are being sold are being sold from someone else's imagination, right? Um, and so, as we're contemplating how to get more people to the table and have their imaginations dreaming up a future where everyone has a place, um, table or not, just everyone has a place to imagine their futures together, you know, we also have to really hone down on what do basic needs look like? Um, what do basic protections look like as the world around us is changing? Thank you for starting us off, Josh. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Hussein, um, for inviting us here. Angelique, it's great to be on this panel with you. It's been awesome having some conversations before this about this. And um, yeah. also want to thank Becca for um, thinking of this and pulling it all together. Um, when uh, I'm incredibly excited to be here, in part because I think when I think about political futures, um, the thing I actually start with is that it's important to be thinking about political futures, um, which sounds really basic, um, but I think it's a critical question to be asking right now, in part because I think for a lot of people, it's becoming increasingly hard to actually imagine any political futures at all. Um, and I think that runs across a few different axes, right? Like there's you know, the rise, the potential rise of fascism, in the US, which I think a lot of people see as a threat to the end of politics as we know it. Um, there's, as Angelique highlighted, there's like visions of climate change, but I think there's also a lot of um, apocalyptic visions of climate change um, and the end of the world in that way. 
Um, and on top of all of that, we're also often just stuck um, in the present moment. It's like a basic fact of who we are is like, we live in response to the world as it is around us. Um, and But part of what the question of even asking the question of political futures does is asks us to go beyond both these sort of apocalyptic visions that are so easily and readily at hand um, of endings and also the things we're stuck in. So I, I think I just wanted to start there first of like highlighting that like it's important to just be asking that question to start with. Um, and it opens up a lot of space. Um, the, you know, by way of like starting to get into what political futures could mean, um, I have like two very quick anecdotes, um, if you'll forgive me. So one, as I was like contemplating this question over the last week um, and like what political futures, what it means, um, I thought back actually to uh, when I was really young and I graduated elementary school and I was going to middle school um, and I was super excited because I was going to be moving from these classrooms where everything was sort of jumbled together to these classrooms where there were dedicated courses. There was an English class. There was a science class. There was a math class. Right. But the one I was really excited about was social studies. Right. And in my head, what I thought social studies was as a kid was we're going to look at social relationships, how people interact with each other. It was like the social piece. We're literally going to stud study being social um, and what that means. And of course, what I found in the classroom was we're studying government and we're studying economics and we're studying history. And all these things are presented as sort of these fixed, dead, inert facts of life, right? And the thing that I, I was thinking about recently with this is how long and how sad it is, how long it took for me to come back around to realize that the things we were actually studying were just formalized versions of our social relationships with each other. Um, that like those structures that we think of as so fixed and tangible are actually just codifications of our existing relationships. And that's part of what politics and economics does, right? Is like the actual codification of that. Um, and along with that, so I was thinking of that on the one hand and that story and sort of like, what is politics in the big sense, right? If we're gonna think about political futures. And then one of the groups that I'm working with right now is doing campaigning around the presidential election. And, you know, I'm not here to talk about the presidential election or that anyone should get involved in anything electoral. But um, as I was working on one of their campaigns, we sent out a blast text and I got this response and I couldn't not like I got it today and I couldn't get it out of my head. So I'm going to share it with you. Um, this was from a, a random person that we had um, texted and they said, you know, this was uh, a text to encourage them to vote for Kamala Harris for president. And they responded, I'm sorry, I can't slash won't endorse Harris Walls. I must weigh the pros and cons. And, and in doing so, my vote is with Trump, American flag emoji. Jesus Christ has and always will protect my job. But at the end of the day, the U.S. was better under Trump, dot, dot, dot. Economy slash inflation, military, back the blue, border security, and our nation as a whole. I don't stand with unnecessary wars, my tax dollars going to other countries, over 20 million illegals coming in and taking all our resources, gender affirming care for children under 18 is wrong, taking parents away, abortion, dot, 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 et cetera. I love all caps Jesus, my country USA, military, US flag emoji, and my family. I will always stand on the side of God, country, and family, then red, white, and blue heart emojis, a salute emoji, American flag emoji, and a cross emoji. And when I received this, obviously there were a lot of thoughts that went through my head, but one of them was that how much was all wrapped together in this one text message for, from this person. That, you know, often in the political space, we think of issues as separate items. But ultimately, um, all of these added up and what it hammered home for me was that the, the work of politics and economics is the work of structuring not just like 
discrete policies here or there, but structuring like particular ways of life, right? That like that is in many ways, like as politics and economic structures um, are social relationships, we are constructing ways of life through them and we're living with existing ways of life. Um, and so like when I think about political futures, one of the big things that I think about is like um, ways of life and identities and how that's being constructed and what's being enabled and what's being prevented um, and what we want to see enabled um, or prevented um, through political action in our structures. So I'm sorry that was a little bit long, but I but that text was so rich. I felt like I, I needed to share it. Thank you, Josh. That, that text is incredibly rich. And I think what I'm hearing, well, first I want to highlight, I think when we talk about RPL and a dynamic methodology, one of our basic starting points is that religion is part of our societies, whether we want to accept it or not, right? I mean, Max Weber, the sociologist over a century ago, was talking about how secularism is really just the normalization of Christianity, the diffusion of Christianity through the public sphere. Um, and so we're always dealing with questions of religion, even when we're not sure that we are. So I think these systems of life, these ways of life is, is a great way of trying to start encapsulating that uh, because we're always dealing with questions of religion, sometimes implicit, but as you point out, explicit. What I'm taken with is I'm hearing both of you talk about what politics means is you both talk about it through the lens of social relationships. Who's sitting at a table together? Politics is the formalization of social relationships. Um, and I think these are incredibly important ways of thinking about what politics is and, and our social relationships. But then you also both point to something else, which is, Josh, in that text, you're talking about how policies and relationships, how the ways we order society needs are not being met. And Angelique, you were really explicit. I mean, it felt like you were walking us through Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like, do people have food right now? Do they have shelter right now uh, in this country? And it feels weird to be talking in 2024 in the wealthiest nation in the world to talk about, are we, are we addressing the bottom needs of society? And I think that's really what uh, the bottom needs of, sorry, of individual welfare in our society. And I think that that is really what I'm excited about by what you're both opening the door to is how do we, you know, if I were to say, let's think of a future time period, I'm just going to throw out 50 years, but you can feel free to do whatever you want. What is that future? Personally? Yeah. I think personally for me, Josh, if you don't mind me going since I've already made an exclamatory statement, um, is one where everyone sees the value of their story. Um, and, and the reason why I, I point to that is, um, Josh, and I, I, I left organizing, but Josh and I have, I have some similar, some similarities in our career. And um, when working in politics and working in campaign politics, one of the things that stuck out to me was the devaluation of story and the devaluation of people's placement in the larger community. And, um, you know, I think one of the most dangerous things that um, colonization did was separate folks from the collective and create uh, individual bubbles that disallowed collective power. And so, um, in that, there's also an erasure of a collective story and where people fit in that. Um, in a more tangible way, when you look at the investment of political dollars, when you look at the investment in education, in roads, in neighborhoods, when you look at where overpasses are built in communities, which are generally lower income 
neighborhoods that don't have a voice. Um, I always ask the question, would the decision have been different had their story been valued? Had they been at the table to explain their values and what their neighborhood meant to them? And I always kind of go back um, to the Claiborne overpass in New Orleans, which split in half uh, Treme, the oldest black neighborhood in the country. Um, historically black neighborhood. Uh, it existed before Louisiana was a state um, of free black artisans, middle class. And my father is old enough to have walked down that street that used to be green lined with bowling alleys. And this is during segregation. So this is a black neighborhood and then in the 60s, there was a decision to put an overpass straight through it. And I feel like that hid um, uh, a lot of the beauty and a lot of the stories. And I think um, it changed the dynamics of power in the city. And so when I say, for me, what our future looks like is that everyone sees value in their stories. Um, not that everybody gets everything they want. Um, that is a whole nother bag of worms. Um, but I think when we look at that, it means that we listen to the most marginalized voices. It means that we give the privilege of imaginative space to everyone so that they are also able to imagine their futures and feel invested and engaged. And I think, you know, the reason I actually got into campaign politics is because I remember a day walking into my congressional office and there was a bill on the floor that stated that if anybody had served their time, they automatically got put back on the voter rolls no questions asked. And if they weren't put back on the voter rolls, they had a right to sue the state. And in my brain as a young lawyer, I was like, this is great. People are less disenfranchised. We'll have people wanting to participate in politics again because they're not just paying taxes and they can't vote. And I was asked, who asked us to sign on to the bill? And it was a very hill question. Um, but that's when I understood the power of a story. That's when I understood that the power of people's voices and the level of fatigue that cultural violence, that real violence, um, has just embedded communities whose voices are the most critical when shaping a future um, has done. And so I, I think for me, the only way to get to a better future and the future I wanna see is where people all understand they are part of a collective, they are part of the community, their story is valued and what they bring to the table is essential. Um, so yeah. Yeah, Angelique, I like part of what I'm hearing and what you're saying is like, you know, one piece of this is that like the political futures are going to be co-constituted, right? Like we're going to co-create it. I mean, not just the two of us, like everyone's going to co-create whatever, you know, political futures and hopefully aspirational political futures, right? Like hopefully, hopefully good ones. Um, but that, you know, there's, an, I, I think the question always comes up, like, what's the end point? Like, what's the, what's the destination in 50 years? And I think, um, without pushing back too hard on this question, which is a good one, it's an important one. Like, I also think it's a trap. Like, I think it's a trap for us to plant a flag down on here's where we know long-term, like 
the political future is going to be. And there's a different way of thinking about political futures, right? Where um, to build on what you're saying, Angelique, or, you know, like there's, you know, recognizing that the political futures are going to be co-created, that they're going to be co-constituted. We can start looking around and thinking directionally rather than about like endpoint destinations right which which will end up just being they won't happen like the world is way too complex and um difficult and uh contradictory but um and like it we also can't escape our own experiences right i feel like one of the other pieces when i've tried to go what's what do i want the world to be like in 50 years is I feel like I end up often just coming to a negation of all of the bad things that I currently see. Like, even though I know that's what I'm not supposed to do, like, I know I'm supposed to be like, ah, yes, here's the visionary, beautiful thing that's going to come out of my head. But it ends up being, well, I don't want to see discrimination and I don't want to see oppression and I don't want to see economic inequality and I don't want to see, you know, and it's sort of like a lot of that. So I think it takes real work. Um, to like look around and go, what are the things that I do actually want? Like, what are the what are the positive things that I see in our world now that like we I don't know what they're going to look like in 50 years, but I know that we can build on them. And like, I want to run toward those things. And like, Angelique, I love what you just described about like everyone having their own voice um, and recognizing the, and like having their voice be recognized. And I feel like one of the, one of the other pieces, like there are a couple of other pieces to me that like fit in with that too, when I tend to think about these, like I think about values a lot. And one of those is like, obviously relationships, which we've talked about a lot here already. 27 minutes in. Um, but uh, the other one is growth, right? Like both one's own ability to grow, but also creating spaces where, uh, and, and, and cr like creating structures and institutions that enable people to grow and change mm -hmm. in different directions. Um, Adrienne Marie Brown writes about how like uh, in her great book, Emergent Strategy, um, she wrote about how at one point, and this one's really stuck with me, like, you know, when we think about futures, like, we've got to stop thinking about and envisioning ones where everybody has to be the same kind of person, you know, like, w we have to be able to allow for different personality types and different kinds of people and that people might conflict and like, growth is a key part of that. So I think about that as like maybe two other values to sit alongside what Angelique has described of just sort of like valuing relationships and creating institutions that really enable us to focus on relationships and also um, growth. Like, it, you know, it driving towards politics and economics that allows people to grow in their varied directions, right? And I, I really, there's something you hit on, I think is really important, Josh, um, which is the deconstructing of what we believe everything has to look like. And that may be the hardest part of the process um, in that we are dealing with problems now that are the byproduct of decisions that have been made in the past. Um, and I remember we were talking before we, we had this conversation about that we're someone's future. And I, and I, 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 and this is, you know, kind of where we ended up is like, we're also someone's past, right? We are going to be someone's past. Um, we are sitting at a point where we are solving for solutions in the future while trying to combat dealing with the byproducts of decisions we didn't make. And it's that's hard because many of us are, many of us have the privilege to begin to deconstruct because we have the context that these systems only exist because someone else imagines them into existence. 
um, our democracy exists because someone else imagined this form of democracy into existence. Um, every single structure that we deal with every day that we feel is so concrete um, did not exist three, 400 years ago. Um, and so it's also a little hopeful in a way. So I, I want I want to say it because it, it sounds like really hard, like, oh, uh, but it's hopeful in a way because it's like walking into a Lego store and those true Lego people know that if you go into the back of the Lego store, there's just a wall of Legos and they have numbers and you get to go, all right, I want 10 of those and 20 of those. And I don't know what I'm making, but I'm, I'm making something. Um, and I, I, forgive me, I can't remember the name of the artist, but there was this, this incredibly talented artist who made sculpture all out of all black Legos. He said, I know what this was supposed to be. And, and I know, I know the instructions that came with it. And, and I, and I get, that these, these were formulated in a way, but I am going to take all these black Legos and I am gonna make something completely new that's never existed before. And I think that's where we sit right now. A lot of us are in this, um, thank you, uh, Echo. I'm gonna like definitely murder his name because I have not heard it. Um, Ikao Namako. Um, and I encourage you to like look like it, it just inspired me seeing what someone could do with black Legos. I was just like, okay, this is incredible. Um, but that's where a lot of us sit right now. We sit in this space of privilege, though it always doesn't always feel that way. And not privilege in the other sense of the word, but in that we see the context. We understand that we are in the middle of triaging something um, that was an experiment, right? It was a democratic experiment um, that didn't include cell phones or broadline or wireless or forever chemicals or interstates, none of it. It didn't even consider more than half of the country being part of the country at the time. And so we are constantly fitting square pegs in the round holes while also going, how do we work on slowly deconstructing this to build a better democracy for future generations? I wanna thank you both. Um... I, you know, Josh, I, I want to be clear. I, I think the pushback is welcome, right? That's the purpose is it, exactly to your point is this is not about sameness. This is about difference. And we, we want that um, that discussion. And I think trying to build off what you and Angelique are offering, you know, when I think about futures, the way I was introduced to futurisms, which is different than what we're talking about here, right? Which is political futures. Mm -hmm. um, but thinking about the moment we're in, as Angelique said, came from a history. How did we get here? So if I think about if there was one thing I could change in the past that would alter the reality we're in now, what would that be? What would be that one point in history that I would say is pivotal to what I find aggravating at this point? If we changed, you know, the 13th Amendment, you know, what would that mean for our conception of abolition today, right? And legalized slavery within the United States. And then taking that, what is the one thing I could change now that would free up people to do something, to have that privilege, the ability to imagine forward? Or to your point, Josh, what is it that we relish, that we thrive in, that we think is healthy and good, inclusive and equitable, that we want to encourage and thrive? How do we create that system? And I think here, I want to try to tie together these threads, is I think we're talking about two different types of politics. Right. And I think, Josh, your opening helped frame it. You're talking about a formalized politics. When we think about voting, when we think about electoral work, right, that's a formalized type of politics that is an institutionalized institutionalization of social relationships. And Angelique, as I'm hearing you, you're talking about social relationships, people who have not 
necessarily been historically in those institutions of power and politics, how they built their own power and their own politics and their own belonging. And I don't think they're necessarily opposed, but we have to understand we're operating at two different levels um, uh, simultaneously. And I think that that's really important to understand that when we say politics, it's not just electoral, but it is organizing, it is social. Um, it is, you know, I'll use my own example since we're getting personal. My ancestors did not have access to formal institutional politics, right? As colonized subjects, as immigrants to the United States, whereas I sit in places that they could never imagine somebody from our family ever sitting, right? Informal institutional politics spaces. Um, but what is my obligation? What is my connection? How do we bridge those social politics, the institutional politics. And I think that that's the question of the futures that we're talking about is not necessarily about the end point, but directionality. And I think that's absolutely the right framing is what are we trying to cultivate out of this? Um, and I hear, I, and I, I will end with one thing and then I will, I will turn to a question is that I think arts are incredibly important in this space. Um, I will, uh, I, I, this is not a secret, everybody in this call will now understand that I love Star Trek. Uh, but 30 years ago, there was a show called Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Um, and 30 years ago, they aired an episode about an event in the Star Trek past called the Bell Riots. And the Bell Riots were about excessive homelessness and over-policing and racial tensions in the United States. And those Bell Riots ushered in a violent moment in American history in the Star Trek universe that then led to a more, well, World War III came in the middle, but then it led to a more equitable society. It had nothing to do with the Bell Riots, though. Um, Antonio Gramsci, uh, the Italian anti-fascist, talks about the oldest dying, the newest waiting to be born, and, here the, and now there are monsters. And it feels like that's what they were getting at. But the Bell Riots happens in the Star Trek universe in 2024. And it's amazing to me how prescient that episode was 30 years ago, reflecting on where the United States was 30 years ago, saying that if this continues on this path, we will hit a crisis point. And it felt like it offered us a way forward and it feels like artists now are offering a way forward. And so what are the imaginings that you have seen, the creative imaginings you've seen of what is possible for us? Now, are we talking about completely fictional or are we talking about what people have tried to construct? I'm talking about what people have tried to construct or or what are they, you know, you talked about uh, Nimico, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who is playing with blackness because these black bricks, because he's talking about blackness and the representations of blackness, mm -hmm. right? I think the, uh, um, the movie Black Panther was such a success because it imagined a future, a present future that is different than what we can imagine now, right? So art is a space of breaking open the probable into what is possible. And I'm I'm looking for those ruptures. What are the things that, let me rephrase it then. What are the things that inspire you and why in terms of these inclusive futures? And they're both acting like I didn't feed them these questions beforehand. This one you did not feed us beforehand. I'm just going to be totally honest about this one. Um, Angelique, I feel like you should go first because you're the, like, you have so much, like, to give in this space. But I'm also happy to go first if you want to, like, think for right, a minute. Go, go, no, go ahead. Well, so, okay, so for things that inspire me, right, like, I think um, I'm going to come at this, like, less from the culture and arts perspective and more from like what I've seen in political organizing, right? Um, and from my own life experience. Um, so in the political organizing space, um, like what I see often is when I start working with groups and we do strategic planning or we do a retreat or we do visioning, right? Um, what I find is that Often, and like, this might sound not inspiring what I'm about to say, but stay with me because 
I do think it's actually inspiring. Often what I find is really similar questions come up about like, how do we want to create this group together? What is the point of our work together? And how do we want to structure decision-making inside of this group? How do we want to make sure that everyone's voices are heard? And every group comes to different visions of what they want to do and how they want to set up the structures. But there's a process that happens where when you combine the vision with then the practical piece of like, how do we want to build this for ourselves in this moment? And you put that power into people's hands. It's just something that like lights up in their eyes, right? And there's, you can see them start to co-create something together. So it's like, it's less a, um, here's what I see as potential futures, right? As a, as a matter of content and more as a matter of process, right? That like, I've seen groups look at where do we want to be in five years and, you know, or what do we want our futures to look like and work together. And then like, sometimes they win. Oftentimes they don't get there. Cause like, it's hard, but like they come out with renewed purpose and ability to work together. So that's on one hand, on the other hand, for me, I think my own background um, and story is like where I come from, like feeds a lot into um, what I see as potential political futures. And frankly, like political futures as um, a site for continued growth and change. Um, I like, I grew up in Western Mass. Um, I like, I was raised by two moms. Um, we lived in a community where there was like a lot of families with two moms. I remember one of the kids I grew up with and went to preschool with um, would say he would, he, his parents were straight, but he was like, he, his assumption at four years old was that half the world was gay. Um, he was like, half of all families have two moms or two dads, right? Um, and like, it's that like, Pe being able to see in all sorts of different places, like people change the things that we think are not changeable, the really big things, norms, all that, like being able to co-create those spaces in small ways in different places and sometimes in big ways, right? Like those ripples fan out. Um, there's like a little bit of a butterfly effect that can happen, you know? Um, Gay marriage is like one of those big, uh, one of those, you know, big issues that people talk about a lot, um, where like public opinion has shifted massively um, in my lifetime. So uh, I think I look around at, that's a little bit of a mishmash, but I look around at all of those things, you know, experientially, and I'm like, those all, those all give me hope and inspire me about the future that we can co-construct together, even when there's obviously a lot of dark stuff on the horizon too. Um, so uh, when I was in high school, there was this book called The Ruins of Ambry. Um, it's by an author named Melanie Ron. Um, she wrote the first book, she wrote a second book, and then never wrote the third book. I'm still, see, we're saying you get it, you get it, you get it. Um, I still think it's somewhere written, but the point of saying this, it was the first book I had ever read where they flipped the patriarchal into the matriarchal and in this world women were the ones who controlled marriage they controlled the ones they they controlled power but it was medieval and there were still you know mages and magic and you know the most powerful people were brown skinned um, and I say all that to say is like at at, at my 10, 10th grade self was like, wait, what? We that that can happen. And so um the point of that is like I am always inspired by people who go, yes, that can happen. Um, so I, I have a very good friend, Brian Joseph Lee. He used to be at the public theater and now he's out on his own. And his whole ethos was like the theater space needs to 
have better ethical treatment of black and brown bodies, especially in the queer space. They ask our opinion, they ask for our expertise. We're the one person at the table, but it is not done in a, um, a safe space for us where we feel like it's productive and that we're not being exploited. And I love how he has worked to create writers um, retreats in different countries, how he's been able to create um, queer spaces for playwrights and screenwriters to come together. And with the sheer understanding, you don't have to produce anything, be in space. You know, I had a, an incredible conversation with an artist, Terrence Osborne today, who is from New Orleans, who his artwork has profoundly impacted the way people see the vibrancy of the city. But so few people ask him about his story and where he is from and why his work is so vibrant. And so having that conversation with him about fifth grade Terrence and seeing that look of process and that look of being able to impact the community in the way that he has, um, literally doing commission piece after commission piece to be auctioned or sold or donated to local organizations to help support the community. You know, a DJ who owns Baldwin Books in New Orleans, whose goal is to make sure every single kid in New Orleans has at least 10 books and working with different organizations. And so I, I wanted to find like a book or, 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 or a piece of work that inspires me, but it really is the people who see the world not fully deconstructed, but when they ask the why, you know, people like Greg Pack, who, when he was 10 years old, wrote down, why can't there be a Chinese-American Batman? Um, he did make a Chinese-American Hulk. I don't know if he's gotten to a Chinese-American Batman. He is also responsible for World War, uh, for uh, Sakaar, uh, Hulk World, uh, because he questioned the why. Um, and so when I think of being inspired about futures, I think of activists like Jessica Bird, who just started Black Camp, um, which is literally on Alex Haley's farm. And she is bringing together activists and advocates to have a space to think in community, to have a space to relearn astronomy so they can tell how to map the world and navigate using the stars, right? That even that that imagination to think backward to the skills that we did have, right? And to be one with the land, you know, they they go out, there's there's an apple orchard. And when the apples are there, everybody gets to come pick a basket and bring it home, right? And so what does that mean to revision and reimagine outside of what we've been told we have to do and ask what what can we do and so it's it's really people for me like it's just I am always so inspired when I see the construction of people's lives and how they're able to create even sometimes in the midst of a dumpster fire Thank you both for that. I, I love hearing this tension, right? That institute, again, that sort of social movement inspiration versus the individual inspiration and, and commitment and engagement with community. I want to take a moment. I, you know, there's, there's probably a lot of art I could think of, but there's something that I was recently exposed to. Um, the Dr. Reverend Kelly Brown Douglas, who is the former uh, head of the Episcopal Divinity School, and is currently a visiting scholar at Harvard Divinity School, came to our summit last May and gave a keynote address. Um, her 
ability to give a speech is artful. It is an art form. And she said something in there that totally broke the way I see the world. And she had, and I'm going to paraphrase her here. I haven't, I haven't sat with it enough to memorize it. I'm going to paraphrase it. She's quoting the Bible. She says, you know, when the first will be last and the last will be first. She says, that's not a call to invert power structures. That's not a call to say, you know, somewhere in the future, people will get their, uh, uh, what, what is due to them, either good or bad, right? If you suffer now, you'll be uh, uh, rewarded in the future and vice versa. If you're rewarded now, you'll be punished. She says, no, the, the challenge here is not that the there's an inversion of the order, that it is a cycle, that there is no first and there is no last. Who's the head and who's the tail? That's The point is that we are getting to a point where these power structures don't matter and shouldn't matter. Um, and for me, it was a very powerful moment to hear such an important and I would argue well-known, at least in the context of the United States, religious text being used not in a way to say that there is a deferred justice um, or that there is, it is possible to be righteous, uh, but with work. But in fact, the goal is to break down the, uh, even the temptation to have this power and control. Mm -hmm. And as we sit here with religion and public life, you know, uh, Josh, you were, uh, you graduated from the program. Angelique, you've been working with us for, for a, a, a while now. Uh, we are all sort of familiar with this language, but I think there's so many people in our audience who are, who are wondering, well, what does this have to do with religion? What does religion and democratic features have to do? And, you know, Josh, you started us out thinking about how these ways of life infuse the way we live, whether we want to know it or not, which I think is an important part of this, right? That there's an implicit question of religion. So when we talk about social relationships, there is this implicit in that are religious communities, whether those are formal institutions like churches and synagogues and temples um, or gurdwars or mushes um, or people's homes uh, or more informal spaces, right? Of people who are seeking together for something. And I think the question I wanna to pose to you is how do you understand not necessarily religion, because I think that that can be a very simple answer or a very complex answer that we don't necessarily have time for right now. But how do you understand why is this important to be having in the context of religion and public life and thinking about why we have to be thinking about religion more broadly in this, in this uh, political future question? So I would say two things to be brief. Um, and there's so many, this is like, oh, what an onion you just put on the table um, that we could just keep peeling away layers at. We'll see how many we get through. Um, I think, so on one level, um, one of the reasons that I wanted to start with that ways of life sort of set up and frame for thinking about what's happening with politics and economics and most of our institutions out in the world um, is because we take for granted as like, we don't actually engage directly with the question of what ways of life our political systems and our economic systems are generally enabling, right? Or are precluding or are <laughs> cultivating, right? And so like, but religions, very often do engage directly with the question of what kinds of lives we want to live, um, whether that's explicitly in terms of theology or whether that's um, in practice, like there's an intentionality that's brought to, uh, in, in many cases, there's an intentionality that's brought to ritual, to practice, to theology, um, to religious community, um, where you are actively engaging with not these sort of siloed questions that we end up with all too often in politics and in economics and in, you know, like pick an issue area and you got it, um, you know, like 
where it becomes about achieving just what we all assume the goal is, right? But gets back to some some of those more fundamental questions. Um, and so in, in one sense, religion and like our assumptions about ways of life, um, which one could say are religious assumptions, um, are infused in everything political. On another level, religions offer uh, a space where you can, where they can, they don't have to, and certainly they don't always, um, but where you can, where they can begin to um, explore and cultivate alternative ways of life and alternative futures in an intentional way, right? In a, in a, in a way where we don't have those venues to do that in most of our lives um, in you know the so-called secular world. Um, at least here in the United States. So personally for me, um, like many people, my idea of community begins rooted in the church. Um, and so, you know, similar to what Josh said, there is this idea of community, uh, of collective, but also of caring for community, um, of taking care of community. Um, this begets things like benevolent societies and um, women's organizations. Even when you look at the Divine Nine, when you look at um, who have now taken a step into saying, we're going to be politically active, who marched in suffrage, the core, well, the Deltas did, um, the core of the beliefs of the divine nine is rooted in religion, is rooted actually in Christianity and monotheistic religion, but also, and for me, this is was one of um, something that stuck very, very much with me throughout my life is a, a poem by Rem Emily Dickinson, and I, I won't recite it, but the whole point of it, um, and it's for those, it's some keep the Sabbath going to, to church um, is that she is saying that her church is nature. And that stuck out to me because part of that goes into the collective understanding that we are responsible ecologically. And so when you think about how we are to care for the world, I think for many that is also rooted in what many people have learned in religion, but I will also say, and I use this stark example and I know I don't have much time. You know, I always go back to the papal bulls, right? <laughs> um, I go back to the justification of slavery and genocide being rooted in not just permission, but an edict given to European countries and how that snowballed so much of what we consider to be civilization and civilized, but also the lens that so many of the things that we are working to deconstruct is rooted in. I also say it took until 2023 for the Pope to verbally, like, it publicly reject the doctrine of discovery, which was used up until the late 1800s in the United States Supreme Court. And so religion has such power, whether it is a community that's been created, whether it's been beliefs, um, because at the same time this year we had the Pope go, hey, Six in one hand, half a dozen the other. We don't believe uh, in abortion, but also that your treatment of migrants is a death sentence. Um, and that voice for so many means so much. Um, and that's not just monotheistic religions, right? Um, you know, as we look at the care that we have for our world, many of our communities, many of the first rules and laws 
Um, we've learned many of the ways that we have these social relationships that Josh and I have been talking about, whether they're codified or not, um, begin with our, our, our values um, and, and our beliefs. And that initial community is so important on how we see the world. And so religious impact, religions, we are still combating with some of religion's impact and deconstructing it and, 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 and like ripping it apart, but also it holds such promise for rebuilding community. Thank you. Thank you both for those really powerful reflections. Um, and the setup you've given us now to turn to some Q and A. Um, and I want to start with uh, a question uh, offered by Hunter. And depending how you answer, I might have a follow-up to this. But uh, the question from Hunter is, how do we deal with the tension between evolutionary incremental change, political and societal, and revolutionary change? Mm. Where does the notion of patience appropriately sit in the conversation? Um. I don't know where Josh sits on this. They have to happen at the same time. Um, it cannot be one after another. And I know that sounds counterproductive the way we understand revolution. <laughs> the, way, the, the way many people understand revolution is I, I think um, very immediate, um, but I am of the opinion that revolutions evolve themselves, right? Like revolution, somebody doesn't just stop in the middle of the street and go, revolution, it's happening now. I mean, it's happened, but normally revolutions require galvanizing, spreading of the word, people coming together, instances happening. And I think that revolutions are somewhat evolutionary. Um, they require um, there to be a growth, um, for people to amass, for people to, and then what most people think of as revolutions is like that boiling point, right? Let they, like, that's like, you know, the French revolution just didn't one day start, like they, they were meeting for a while, like they were having these conversations. Um, and so I say all that to say both should be happening at the same time because one thing we mentioned in the beginning is like yes we're thinking about political futures and looking at this idea of a more just future and and opening the doors for the more imaginary but we can't suddenly forget about what's happening right now um and you know the decisions that are made every single day that impact millions of people. Um, so yes, people still have to run for office. People still have to you know be on city council. People still have to do testimonies as a revolution is building, in my personal opinion, because it's necessary. Yeah, I could not agree, Anjali more um with your answer just now um like i think um just to add on a little bit because i think you've captured so much there um when we think about what happens with revolutionary change when you have these moments where big you know there are uh you know, decades where weeks happen and weeks where decades happen or whatever the, you know, the Lenin thing is. I'm I'm butchering it, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, when you have those big moments, right, there's nothing to say that those necessarily continue to push in one direction once that moment has passed, right? Oftentimes what we also see is like the change that happens during revolutions is fragmentary and shoots off in different directions. And in many cases, also like powerful interests retrench, right? Um, and so like a big thing that's like sitting in the background here, which we shockingly haven't talked more about already is like power and how you build power and how you um, leverage power 
to then accomplish change. Like change doesn't just happen. And when I talk about power, like I don't just mean power over people, right? I also mean the ways in which through the relationships that we form, we expand one another's capacities. So when you create an organization, right? And you give it structure with five of your friends, suddenly you all individually and collectively have the opportunity to do things that you did not otherwise before you created some structure to plug yourselves into, right? Like in a very simple kind of way here. So um, I think there's a lot to say and like, maybe it's another talk at another point, or maybe we'll get more questions about it. But a lot of like how these futures end up being enabled, right, is not just us sitting here thinking about what could a future look like, but it's people building and creating their own capacities to manifest those futures in the real world together. And to Angelique's point, like the likelihood that we actually end up attaining any of the futures or the kinds of futures that we're interested in pursuing with just a flash in the pan revolutionary moment is incredibly small all on its own. You need to have the power to back it up. So like, just to put a really like specific point on what Angelique was like covered in real depth there, like that's my only other sort of tidbit, two cents to throw in. Uh, I think that's great, Josh. I think it's a, it's a really, uh, a useful way to think about it, Angelique. I appreciate your approach as well because I think let, let me let me give a concrete example and tell me if I'm under, tell me if I'm understanding you correctly. But if I'm understanding you both correctly, is people sort of have a, a visceral reaction to revolution? Like revolution is bad. The question is who whom is it bad for? Like there's a reason a revolution is happening, right? Uh, and we've got a we've got to be able to understand those those structures. But if we think about the American Revolution. Right. I don't think any American is saying we shouldn't have had the American Revolution, right? Because that creates all sorts of dissonance for me. Maybe there are people who can support it. I can't. But so, but that happened also because there's an intellectual arc that is developing beforehand and organizing the amassing of power. Uh, that once the revolution happens, you then enter into state building, nation state building. Which, if we remember, the the Articles of Confederation actually don't hold the country together. It's it's the Constitution that leads to that, but it's because this groundwork and this community organizing has happened. And I'm using community organizing very loosely here, right? But that's I mean that's this is the only community that matters at the time. The people who could vote, the land. Owners. I mean, I'll just I'll just add it. Like I think there's you know we've talked a little bit about like social relationships and then like institutional relationships and like I think there are real differences between those, but I think it's also really fluid. Right. Like, I think that's a real spectrum. And like, in some ways, you can look at the American Revolution as like an example of a certain kind of community organizing in a particular community. Right. And what came out of it? What were the structures that they developed for their organization? It was Congress, the judiciary and the executive branch. And like, we may like them, we may not like them, but like that was how they structured those relationships and figured out how to share power together um, and how to like also expand the power that they did have. So that's just like, sorry to jump in on your point there, but you got me very excited. Um, it's just like, I, it, cause oftentimes when I'm working with organizations around, you know, organizing, they end up creating their own mini governments, right? Like that's a little bit how it ends up happening because if you don't structure the power intentionally within your social relationships, a power structure will emerge yep. regardless. Well, and um, at the end of the day, yeah. a social contract is necessary. Yeah. And it's, you know, and I, and Hussein, I like the way you, and Josh, you kind of said it too. It's like, to this day, we're questioning, well, who was that particular social contract? That wasn't, that social contract did not include me. Yeah. Um, But I also, Hussein, like the way you highlight it, is that we think of revolutions as bad, but we also have to think of the narrative that we've been told. So, i.e., a lot of people will look at the Haitian Revolution, which, because it's so anachronistic and amorphous in people's minds, they don't realize it was one of the catalysts for the Civil War, was the fear that this country 
the only country to emancipate itself from slavery rose up and abolished the system. It's not like they didn't go in, just as Josh said, and create another system. <laughs> and it's not like Mexico had not just done the same thing. We don't call it New Spain. We call it Mexico because <laughs> they gained their independence um, multiple times. Uh, but we don't think of those revolutions in the same way, right? And so I think it's also, you know, revolution isn't bad if revolution is necessary, but revolution is messy. I, 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 sorry, Josh, you came up with me, please. No, I was just going to ask if you were going to take us to the dark side of that example, Hussein, because I, I got very excited and cut you off, but... Um... Uh, go for it. Take us over, North Vader. No, I mean, I think just the 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 other side of that, right, is of the American Revolution example and many revolutions, which I, I don't know if you were gesturing at Hussein, but I, like, I feel duty bound to take us is like, you know, is the retrenchment like you have the revolution and then a power class emerges and then, you know, or has already existed in many cases. Um, and also along with whatever change they are in themselves seeking reinforce their own power um yeah. and that's like i think where a lot of this vision and values piece comes back into the equation right is like we can be it's not just about figuring out a structure of power that like works in whatever you know gets uh you know all the trains run on time or whatever um, it's about intentionally structuring our relationships in a way that we want to see and allows us to continue to grow and iterate. Um, so anyway, yeah. I think it I all comes so back to, you know, who does the future yeah. serve? Yeah. Right. Who does it serve? Thank you, Angelique. And uh, Josh, to your point, I wasn't going to use the American Revolution for that. I was going to use the French Revolution, but yes, the point is still valid. The French Revolution is more stark for that. That's Yes, that's exactly. One. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> I know things. Uh, so, um, Josh, this question, I have a question that's directed to you from an anonymous user. Uh, but Angelique, I, I strongly suspect you will have something to say about this because you've hinted at your, your background in this. Um, so Josh talked about how many organizations and campaigns are beholden to election cycles, et cetera. How can we break out of those cycles? From your vantage point, what obstacles stand in the way of having broader, more long-term vision for our democratic systems? Can you read the second part of that question one more time? From your vantage point, what mm -hmm. obstacles stand in the way of having a broader, more long-term vision for our democratic system? Yeah, I mean, one of them is just headset, right? One of them is just mindset. Um, I think we have a, we pay a lot of attention to every single election. Um, and what that ends up doing, and we spend a lot of money on every single election, um, there are structural pieces of that, right, like, uh, that are built in. Um, but part of it is, the more that we fixate ourselves on every two-year election cycle, the less we're thinking about the longer term. It's not necessarily about knowing what the longer term destination point is, but we're building campaigns right with some with you know hundreds sometimes thousands sometimes hundreds of thousands of volunteers that close up shop and end every 2 years mm -hmm. and then we start new campaigns and we start all over and what we have in many cases lost are um you know uh communal organizations whether they be religious civic uh, the decline in labor unions, right, that give people long-term community and relationships that enable them to um, have and leverage long-term power, right, and build long-term power. And so if we want to break out of this cycle, what we really need are is more, you know, let's build something that is not just going to close up shop after November 5th this year or whatever the election day is two years from now or the years after that, right? And let's stop just playing defense on 
the worst possible case scenarios electorally. And let's instead invest in year round organizing. Let's invest in put like building organizations where people actually have the power to do things where we're not just going out and trying to recruit people in to do little tasks along the way, but where they actually have decision-making power and can build that community themselves where power is distributed. Like we need to be doing a lot more investment in that. And that's like, that's not like, you know, a big visionary, like pipe dream kind of thing, right? Like we've had these things, these things exist um, and they have existed. It's not that they're easy. Um, but they are concrete and we can start at any stage uh, of the process investing in that both like monetarily and with our own time. Um, kind of piggyback on what you said, Josh, and I think this is something that, you know, our systems of communications and trusted voices have been gutted over the last three decades. Um, many of the voting organizations that used to be there, many of the rides to the polls that used to exist outside of campaign structures, the local newspapers, you know, the micro and macro influencers um, outside of the church, a lot of them have been systematically dissolved. And I think I agree so much on this idea that we have these campaigns that come in, they spend a lot of money, they bring in organizers from other states, other cities that don't know the community and they're not trusted voices. And there needs to be consistent structures on a local and state level that are consistently informing the communities, but also um, a more collective mindset um that plugs into these local structures and are investing in these local structures all year round um because it's it is hard to trust and so it creates this it does it creates a level of mistrust you only came here to get my vote mm -hmm. you don't care about me um, you don't care about this community. What do you know about this community? And that's a very fair reaction. When you've brought in an organizer from Las Vegas who's never been to North Carolina in their entire life, or somebody, my example, from Louisiana, who luckily just happened to be from the South, so it made it a little better, but it's about giving and empowering the community as well. And so what does it mean to recreate something that's just kind of been dismantled? Um, and that there's a lot more variables that goes into the party system and, 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 and poll workers, and we're not gonna go into that. But I think, I think Josh, I, I absolutely agree with you that you know a lot of those trusted sources just aren't there. So I want to summarize quickly, and again, if I'm, please tell me if I'm hearing you wrong, but it sounds like part of the way to break this cycle is not being reliant on cyclical events to organize the community, but to organize the community around values, needs, desires that the community has that require cyclical individuals, electoral in this case, to come in court and support or, and, and buy into that power. So it is that power resides within the community. And thus, and to your question of trust, Angelique, it is then about that relationality. So it's not extractive, it's not transactional, but is really ongoing. Uh, and so this is, to me, it feels like the bridge between the social and the institutional that we've been talking about, right? That these are in fact, there are different ways of organizing, but they have to be in communication and contact. And um, uh, so, I, so I appreciate that. Um, we've had a few questions that I wanna make a statement on, and then a question I wanna to throw to the two of you. So a lot of people are asking, are we working with organization X, are we working with organization Y, are we working with organization Z? Um, we, as, an, as a, a program, do work with a few organizations, none of the ones mentioned so far. We do have students who've engaged with some of these organizations. I think the question is, how many of these organizations are thinking about religion in their democratic futures? 
Uh, because if they're not understanding the role of religion plays now, they can't be imagining what role religion plays in the future or how to think critically about religion in that space. Um, and I have to, I have to uh, ask and think that, uh, you know, people think about the bi-directionality here and that who uh, we choose to engage with are people who are open to the idea that religion exists now and exists in the future and is, has an impact on society. Um, so can you imagine a future without religion? Yes, you can. Is that a realistic future? I'm not entirely sold on that idea. Uh, so the question that I want to throw to the two of you, uh, this is in response to our framing of directionality versus fixed endpoints in our futurist thinking. How do you aim for a direction where you don't have a destination? Right? So how do you do directionality without thinking about endpoints, which I think is a really wonderful, broad question. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a second part to this, to honor the question, this is from Zane, I wanna honor the question, um, but I think you sort of implicitly answered already. So, you know, um, how, how do you have that endpoint, uh, without having that endpoint where measurability of success is so important in the world now, how, if without an endpoint, how do you say, yes, I'm meeting these metrics to success? So once upon a time, uh, when I was a young 20 something, I was told that I should make a five-year plan. And for every year after that, I made a five-year plan. And none of those plans ever came to fruition um, because they were very concrete um, they were very, they were based only on the amount of knowledge that existed at the moment in which they were created. Where I was situated at the moment, what access of knowledge I had, my perspective of the world, how much like, like literally when I say situated, I mean, sitting in a congressional office. Like, and only what my 27 year old self could understand of the world. When I turned 20 something, almost 30 something, I decided that I was going to write down what I wanted to see and the life I wanted to create. How I wanted my life to work, what I wanted my days to look like. And I stopped saying, I want to be the senior XYZ at this organization. And I want to live in this house on this street. And I was able to identify when opportunities came my way, what fit within that vision of what I wanted to see my life look like. Um, I would love to take credit for that. I definitely was like listening to a radio show and a very smart person was like, stop trying to make the world fit into your vision of it because you only know so much of the world. Um, and I think in, that is the same way I believe Josh and I are looking at a future. Every single one of us only has so much knowledge. Even if you put all of the smartest people in a room, they can only use so much of their brain. And so I think the perspective is if we come to these concrete idealistic solutions, they actually may not be the best solutions. And they have a very short runway. But if we start thinking about making sure that everyone lives comfortably, that everyone has a living wage, that everyone has the freedom to create um, a family when and how they want to, like the value sets, 
allow there to be guidance to solutions as knowledge comes available. I 100% agree with that, Anjali. What a what a great example of sort of the difference there. I, I, the only thing I'd tack on, right, is um, not having destinations doesn't mean you don't agree to things or like set goals for some things, right? Like there's nothing wrong with a goal for an organization. Um, there's nothing wrong with like, he, you know, going, here's what we want to Angelique's point. Here's what we want our organization on the inside to look like. Here's what we want it to look like on the outside. And here's a way for us to like, you know, try and identify whether we're on the right track with that, whether we're getting there, where I think the trap is just to be super clear about this with the destination piece is, oh, in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years. Here's where we're going to be. And now we're going to work backwards on all of the benchmarks that come to that point that far out in a world that is entropic naturally. Um, we're going to like work backwards on all the benchmarks and like we're, we've now created a system that like we're now working to serve rather than like iterating on and revising regularly to make work for us. And I think there's a real difference in that. And that doesn't mean we don't use as a way to change the lens, where do we want to be in five years, right? As like maybe a way to look at what matters to us, right? But that's like, that's the limit of really what it should be. It should not be, hey, we're going to have an organization. It's going to be structured this way. And people are going to be like this. And this person's going to feel this way about it. And this person's going to have this. And this person's going to have this role with like these powers. And this person is no longer go like, it's just not going to happen that way. It's just never going to happen that way. And we do a disservice to ourselves, I think, as people who are living out our lives together and building these organizations together when we set up a system that is not just a structure for us to use to help get us there, but is a structure, a system that now we have to serve um, and only works as a way for us to serve it. And frankly, like, I think that's a problem big picture with a lot of the structures that we currently have is, you know, when you look at our economy or when you look at our political system, we are working for those structures and not the other way around. Um, and like, that is another way to think about big picture. I just landed on that three minutes before the end. Good thing you stuck around. Um, yes. You know, what we could think about for political futures, right? Right. Thank you both. Okay. So quickly, one clarifying statement and then close the question. We're going to end. Um, the clarifying statement, Josh's day job is his day job. It is not his role at Harvard. We are a non-political institution. He is not working. Um, uh, his political job does not connect with his fellowship at Harvard. So you both have 30 seconds each. What is one practical takeaway uh, our audience can have from this conversation? What is the way they can build their political future? Start with building community right now. Um, start with looking at your community and seeing where voices are needed and necessary and start setting your own table. Thank you, Josh. A hundred percent with Angelique on this. Um, if you want to get really concrete about it, like take 10 minutes, sit down, pull out a piece of paper, pull out a pen, write down names of five people who you want to do work with and help make change with and identify where, one, what you want to work on and two, where you have the opportunity and power already to help do that and then call them. Sit down and like magic will happen. I promise. It's like it's not it's not rocket science. There's lots of resources out there. So, I want to give you a golf clap. Both. Thank you so much because I'm by a microphone. If I any lateral hurt people, uh, but thank you both for this. This has been such a wonderful, enlightening conversation. I appreciate you starting off our series. Uh, for those of you who've uh, joined us, uh, please make sure that you sign up for the next three events in our series. They will continue on the next three Tuesday evenings. Uh, you do re need to register for each event separately. Our event next week is on media, religion, and the nation. Uh, that is Tuesday, October 1st, at, starting at 6 p.m. Eastern. 
uh, and you can sign up for our newsletter at rpl.hds.harvard.edu, which lists this event and so many other wonderful events we host here in the program. Uh, thank you to the audience for being in here. Thank you for my uh, program mates for making sure this event went off without a hitch. And Anjali and Josh, to you both again, thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, and uh, a fun and enlightening conversation. And thank you, Hussein. You were an amazing moderator. Thank you for amazing. keeping us on track. Thank you, Hussein. Sponsor, Religion and Public Life. Copyright 2024, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.